morning, church. Great to see you all this morning. Would you stand up with us and sing? Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. Worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day, God. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may be past and whatever lies before me, let me be singing to you even when it comes. Yes, Lord, oh, my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to end. Your name is great. Is kind. Oh, how your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to cry. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Jesus paid it all, all to 
special outdoor service this morning let's pray together will you pray with me lord god we thank you for today lord we praise you for the sunshine and for the breeze as well lord we thank you for your creation for the chance to enjoy it for the chance to be together uh to to love each other and to know each other and lord most of all to know and love you father i pray that you would be with us now that you would speak to us open our hearts and our minds to say in Jesus name amen well let me say good morning again oh come on you can good morning all right all right that sounds better hey today we are, are wrapping up our series uh, called turn the page and I want to start today by giving you a quick lesson on how to create a sculpture a sculpture now I'm not talking about you know beginner level uh, class here making some kind of sensual pottery with Patrick Swayze Demi Moore none of that kind of stuff I, I'm talking about high quality you know art gallery level sculptures the principle of sculpting is actually quite simple Michelangelo um, you have heard of him I bet he sculpted perhaps the most famous statue ever his statue of David, David as he's preparing to slay Goliath. He said this about sculpting. The sculpture is already complete within the marble block. Before I even start my work, it's already there. I just have to chisel, chisel away the superfluous material. For example, Let's say you want a sculpture out of stone of a family or maybe a sculpture of a mother and child like these here. Here's how you do it. You start with that block of marble, that block of stone. You grab a hammer and a chisel and you just pound away, you chip away everything that doesn't look like a family. Pretty simple, right? That's all there is to it. 
oh, this piece doesn't look like a family, so chip, chip, chip. there you go. This doesn't really look like a mother and child, so you chip around it until it looks like a mother and child. After you chip away everything that doesn't look like the, the picture you had in mind, then you have a beautiful sculpture. Trey, why don't you come up? We can, uh, we'll pass these around for people. Of course, there is a tricky part, right? The tricky part is to have the vision to see the mother and child in the marble as you start. Only sculptures with the best vision can do that. You've got to distinguish between the parts of the marble that will look like a family, look like a mother and child, and the parts which do not. That's the hard part. Being able to see the statue that's hidden within, within the block of stone, it takes a special kind of vision. But when you see it and you start to chip, chip, chip away at everything that doesn't look like what you want it to be, it's a bit oversimplified, of course, but the principle of sculpting, it's essentially the same a as your ability to live a life of vision. We've been talking about how to live a life of vision. And as we end our series today, we end our Turn the Page series, I just want to keep inviting you to turn that page over, to be ready and willing to say goodbye to the trouble of the year behind us. And to be ready to set yourself up for what comes next, for that great new chapter, for a great vision of what could happen next. In the first week, we talked about how vision begins with the ability to see the present. You've got to be able to see the present with precision and accuracy. You need a, a clear understanding of who you are and, and where you're at, what's going on in the present moment. I advised you to take a look at your strengths and your weaknesses so that you could determine what needs to change, what needs to move forward. And last week, we talked about how to develop the ability to see where that vision will lead us. Where is the vision taking us? What's the big picture? I asked you to think about what you really, really want out of your life. And even better is to know what God wants for your life. It involves finding uh, a vision with the best possible outcome. We want to shoot for the stars and, and find what is most worthy of our best efforts to dream big. It helps you develop that long-term perspective so that you can see a finished cathedral instead of just a stack of bricks and a bag of cement. Today, we'll talk about what it looks like to put this into practice. What does it look like not to just have a vision and dream a vision, but to put it into practice? Jesus closed his famous Sermon on the Mount with this, Matthew 7. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. You can't just hear them. You've got to put them into practice. When God gives us a vision for our life, we are called to do more than just dream about it. We've got to have more than just good int intentions. We've got to put our vision into practice. It's got to be backed up with some action. <coughs> the inventor Thomas Edison said this. He said, vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> it's a hallucination. It's nothing more than a dream. It's words without action. It's a dream that will never be realized. You can think of this uh, as sports. It, you always hear the losing coach interviewed after the game, and the losing coach says things like, well, we lost the game because we failed to execute. You know, we had a, a good game plan. We practiced hard. We called the right plays, but we just didn't execute. We dropped the ball and so on. You hear that in virtually every press conference from the losing coach. Vision without execution is just a hallucination. It's a fantasy, a vapor that vanishes in the wind. And so today's message is about that. It's about executing and taking action, putting feet to your vision. Here, I got three steps for you this morning about putting your long-term vision into practice day in and day out. First is this. Start with a process of elimination. 
elimination. Here's what I mean. Think back to that, that big block of marble. And, and you want to sculpt it into something beautiful. So you start chipping away, right? Chip, chip, chip. And, and you chip out anything that doesn't look like your vision. You chip away anything that doesn't look like that family or mother and child. This means that you look at the marble block each day. This is something you do each day. And you ask God for the vision of what it could be. What could the, the marble block of this day be? And then you look at your actions. You look at yourself and you ask, does this behavior, do, do my actions look like the person I want to become? Do I look like a loving husband? Do I look like a devoted follower of Jesus? Do I look like a, a dedicated employee? Do I look like the man or woman of God that I want to be? Whenever the answer is no, you, you got to chip away. You just keep chipping away at that block of marble. You eliminate the things that don't fit. Paul talks about chipping away in, in another way. He calls it putting things to death. Paul had a, a way with words, didn't he? In, in Colossians 3, here's what Paul says. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. If you want to be a person of vision, if you want your life to be all that it can be, you've got to be ready to say, some things have got to go. You've got to be ready to say goodbye to some of those things. And here's the tricky part. Some of the things that you need to change, they won't be obvious at first glance. This will take some time. Uh, this isn't always the, the clear list of, of big nasty things that, that Paul said, right? Sometimes our list doesn't really compare with that. Our, our list doesn't look that bad compared to others. But we're not playing a comparison game. A clear vision helps us see not just what is bad or wicked, but it helps us see the things that aren't beneficial, the things that aren't leading us forward to where we want to go, the things that aren't leading us to be the person we want to be. Maybe for you it means watching a little less TV. Maybe it's a, a little less time on social media or, or less time spent with people that you know are going to drag you down. Maybe it's spending your money differently. That can have a hold on us. Maybe it's your diet. All, all of these things, they either work in your life to move you a little closer or a little further away from your vision. So keep asking. Which of my habits, which of my attitudes and actions and behaviors are like the person I want to become and which ones are not? Living with vision means you're willing to eliminate. You're willing to chip away all the things that need chipped away. Here's the second step in putting your long-term vision into practice. Number two is this. Develop a daily routine. You've heard me say this before, and you've heard me say how I struggle with it, right? This is tough, because each day has plenty of trouble of its own, right? Each day, you can be overwhelmed quickly, but you've got to establish some daily routines, some habits, some patterns that you can count on that are leading you forward. For example, uh, John Grisham, some of you have read his books. He, he writes great books, but when he got the idea to write his very first novel, uh, he was working as a, a full-time attorney with a heavy caseload, and, and he had a busy family life at home as well. He had a story in mind that he wanted to tell, but he had no easy way, no time to get it done. He knew he couldn't just crank out a whole novel on his few days off. So here's what he did. He made the decision to do what he could. What he could do was go into work an hour early each day. And in that hour, he would write one page. He just wrote one page a day. That way, in about a year's time, he would finish the first draft of his novel. 
And that's exactly what he did. He set a pattern and he stuck to it. And he wrote uh, the book, A Time to Kill, one page at a time. It became a best-selling book. It became a popular movie, and it launched his massive writing career. It all happened because of his daily routine, because he had a vision for his life, and he pursued it small step by small step every day. What this means is that when John Gershom didn't feel like writing, he went ahead and wrote anyway. When he wasn't sure of what would come next in the story, he went ahead and kept on writing. It meant that when all the agents and publishers were telling him no thanks to his first drafts, he kept on writing day after day after day. He kept at it, those daily routines. In one of the Psalms that are attributed to Moses, Moses says this. He says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That's Psalm 90. Teach us to number our days so that we can gain a heart of wisdom. Moses isn't talking about counting your days, trying to figure out when you're going to die. He wasn't talking about counting our days as much as he's talking about making our days count. Know that there's a limited number, that each one counts. Each one has a number to bring you closer to your vision. In other words, Moses is saying, make each day count. The question we must ask is this, in order to live the life that God wants for us, the life that he desires, in order to pursue the, the big vision for my life, what do I need to do every day? What do I need to do daily? What routines will direct and guide my life day in, day out, on a regular basis? You know, for most of us, this is going to include some pretty normal things, things like prayer, things like being ready to pitch in and help others, worship, fellowship, and discipleship. We talked about that last month. A and then there's a list that's specific to just you. What do you individually need to do? Maybe it's time with your family, time with your spouse. Maybe it's time exercising and, and being healthy. Maybe it's working hard at your job. Maybe that's part of your vision, depending on your situation. But those daily habits and, and sometimes weekly habits, they're crucial. It's not enough to just think about it, to just say, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> You've got to put them into action. You've got to write them down. You've got to put them on a schedule, plan it in part of your day so that you can start to take action. That's the execution part that Thomas Edison was talking about. If you want to live a life of vision, the key is understanding and seeing what needs to be done today. What needs to be done today to get started, to make it happen, to move forward. In the Old Testament, the book of First Chronicles, it tells us uh, about uh, David before he was king and, and King Saul. And in here, there's a list of the, the groups of men who were joining together with David to battle against the, the wickedness of King Saul. And they list out these groups. I want you to pay attention to how one group was described. The men of Issachar. The men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Well, guys, that's good advice. We want to be like the men and women of Issachar. That's the kind of person you want to be, someone who understands the times, who sees the present clearly, and who is ready to do something about it. Be like them. Understand. See what's really happening. See the big picture of where you want your vision to take you, and, and then do it chip away, eliminate the stuff that doesn't fit, and be prepared to do whatever it takes. It won't be easy. I, I can promise you that. It won't be easy. It wasn't easy for David or the men of Issachar or for anyone else. Be prepared to do what it takes on a daily basis. The execution of our vision, it, it either shrinks or it grows on any given day, on each and every day. So take advantage of those days. Carpe diem, right? Carpe diem. 
Here's the third step for putting your vision into practice. Number three is this, settle in for the long haul. The long haul. There's a verse in Proverbs that I like. It's Proverbs 21. And, and in the Living Bible, it says this, steady plotting brings prosperity, but speculation brings poverty. Plotting, that's not a word that we use much, <laughs> is it? Steady plotting. The, the modern uh, NLT translation says it this way, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Good planning, hard work, plotting, plotting forward, moving ahead. I, I want to share with you a little bit about uh, a man named William Carey. This proverb reminds me of William Carey. He's often called the father of modern missions. William Carey was a, a man in the 1700s whose life was driven by vision, specifically a vision that he would reach out to the foreign lands of the world so that they could be introduced to Jesus Christ. His vision was to see the, the church fulfill the Great Commission, not just talk about the Great Commission, not just read about the Great Commission, but to do it, to go into all the world and to make disciples for Jesus. And despite opposition, he refused to surrender this vision. He stuck with it. He made the long haul. In 1792, he organized a missionary society. And in their first meeting, he preached a sermon entitled, Expect Great Things from God. Attempt Great Things with God. That's a good title, isn't it? <laughs> Sometimes the sermon title is so good, you can feel inspired just by that. Attempt great things with God. A year later, William Carey and a colleague of his packed up their families and they set sail for India. It's the 1700s, remember? The first years there were far from easy. I in fact, they were often devastating. Carey contracted malaria, and it was severe. He was bedridden for months. And then after he recovered, his son died of dysentery. His colleague, his co-worker, gave up and went back to England, leaving behind Carey and his grieving family. They faced enormous financial pressure. They went years without seeing any results. That sticks out to me. I mean, you can, you can stick through some really hard things if you're seeing the payoff, right? If you're seeing some results. But he didn't baptize his first person in India for seven long years. Seven long years. He settled in for the long haul. He kept working day after day. And over the next three decades that he stayed there, he translated the Bible into India's major languages. He translated it. He founded a college that is still around today, and he helped bring significant social change and reform to the Indian culture. Towards the end of his life, William Carey attributed one thing to his success. He wrote this, I can plod and I can persevere. He stuck it out. He was the kind of guy that knew his vision and who would hold on to it for the long haul. Big vision requires plotting. It requires planning and hard work. It requires day in and day out execution over the long haul. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote this in Galatians. Let us not become weary in doing good. He knows it's hard. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Say that last phrase with me, will you? If we do not give up. If you want to live a life of vision, be ready for the long haul. Be prepared to plod and persevere. Be prepared to follow that path of your vision day after day and year after year. When we think about people of great vision, 
we often think of, of someone that has great insight into the future, people that can see ahead and anticipate the, the trends that are coming for us. Maybe people like Mark Zuckerberg, who invented this little thing called Facebook. Or Jeff Bezos, who looked at the internet and decided that he could start a book company that would become the biggest shipping industry anywhere. Vision includes that ability. It includes the ability to see what lies ahead, what is coming over the horizon. But friends, that's only part of it. It's only part of it. Those with the greatest vision also must see today clearly. You've got to see today first. Today you've been given a block of marble. What will you do with it? Each day you're given this gift from the Lord. Those with vision, they see what's inside that stone, what's inside that block. They see the family. They see the mother and child. And they're willing to do the work to chip away everything that doesn't fit. True vision understands the promise of the future starts today. So, folks, um, we've just come through a, a traumatic year and a half. A and I don't use the word traumatic lightly. Uh, we, we can talk about it being a hard year, a tough year. Well, boy, wasn't that a strange year? But the truth is, for many of us, it was nothing short of traumatic. The world changed. Our lives changed. And we're still figuring it out <laughs> and how to move forward. And frankly, it's probably not over yet. You know, I, I think we'll be dealing with the fallout of COVID for a long time to come. But that does not mean that we can't turn the page. That doesn't mean that we're unable to turn the page and see what comes next. We can begin looking forward into that next chapter. We can begin today to live a life with vision, a vision that will direct our future. All right, let me wrap up with a few thoughts. We've discussed a, a whole lot of ideas in this Turn the Page series, how you can get a turn the page kind of vision for your life. I've given you some practical steps. I hope you've taken advantage of them. You want to see the present clearly with accuracy. You want to have a clear understanding of who you are and where you're going. You want to see the big picture, the big picture vision and, and where it's leading you. You want to see the, the cathedral out there that your future can hold. And you see what needs to be done today. What do I need to do today? Like the men of Issachar, you understand the times and you are ready to take action. You are ready to do what needs done. You envision that block of marble and what it could be. You're ready to chip away. You're going to execute the play, not just talk about the play. You're going to take action and then you're going to stick with it for the long haul. It's not going to be easy. We're going to need each other. We're going to need encouragement, accountability. We're going to need to watch out for each other. And most of all, we're going to need to stay connected to our Lord. He's where our hope is. He's where our power and strength is. At the very beginning of this talk, I, I talked about Ted Williams. If you can remember three weeks ago, how Ted Williams had a lifelong dream to become the, the greatest hitter in baseball and how he achieved that dream because of his amazing vision. He had truly amazing vision. So let me close the series with one more story about Ted Williams. It's about how his career ended. Ted's career didn't end in controversy or in scandal. Ted did not uh, give up and walk away after uh, World War II or the Korean War, which he served in both. He didn't merely wither away and spend his time there as a player who had passed their prime. No, in September of 1960, there was a home game at Boston's Fenway Park. And in the final game he played, at his final at-bat, Ted stood at the plate. He watched a pitch or two go by until, with his great vision, 
he saw the one he was looking for. And with his very final swing as a major league player, he drove the ball high into right field and deep into the stands. Ted Williams ended his career with a home run like every ball player dreams. <laughs> Friends, God desires the same thing for you, that your life will be lived in such a way, that your life will be lived with such a vision that you knock the final pitch right out of the park. That's what a God-centered vision does for us. Anchor, let's turn this page together. Let's get ready for what comes next. Let's watch out for one another, encourage one another, and keep each other moving forward. Let's follow the Apostle Paul who declares this. I love this verse. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's live each day reaching for what lies ahead, pressing on, straining forward, knowing that the Lord himself goes ahead of us. Starting right now, let's find our vision. Let's find our life in Christ. And he will give us life and life to the full. Amen? Amen. Church, at this time, we're going to prepare for communion. So I, I think most of you have uh, uh, the communion ele elements with you. If you don't, you can shoot your hand up and we'll get one to you. I see uh, Laura there. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for life itself. The fact that we are here in the first place. That we're here because you love us. That we can know you because you reach out to us. Because Christ came in the flesh to show us the way, the truth, and the life. That Christ paid with his flesh the price for our sins, bringing us forgiveness and reconnection with you. And Lord Jesus, we remember you. We know what you did on the cross for us. We remember, we celebrate, we worship you for giving us the gift that we could never have on our own your love, your mercy, your kindness, your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen. On the night he would be betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And after he gave thanks, he looked at his disciples and he said, this is my body. This is my body. And it would be broken for us. It would be broken for them, broken for me, broken for each of you. And each time you eat it, do so remembering me. We remember you, Jesus, the body of Christ. After supper, he took the cup and he said, this will be the new covenant, the new promise to you, to all people that comes in my blood. And Jesus, we remember how your blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, Lord, the blood of Christ.
praise you, Lord. We say thanks again. Thank you for calling us home, for calling us your sons and daughters, for bringing us back into the family and for washing us white as snow. That while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. Thank you, Lord. In your holy name, amen. Well, church, uh, we'll, uh, we'll transition now. We'll uh, get ready to receive the morning offering and have announcements. Uh, we're going to keep things short today since we're outside. Uh, we won't uh, do much in the way of sermon sequel. We won't dismiss the kids for their class. Um, but we do want to make sure that you know what's going on here at the church. And it um, looks like the ushers are, are ready to receive the morning offering. Um, whoo. And the breeze is ready to blow our papers away. Uh, before we receive the offering, let's pray again. Lord, thank you uh, for providing for Anchor. Thank you for the way that you bless this ministry, uh, not just financially, Lord, but with each person gathered here, with each person watching online. Lord, we thank you for this church family, and we pray that you would use us uh, to move your kingdom forward, that we could be people of vision, that we get on board with whatever you want to do, because we want to follow after you, Lord. We are your people. So take us, take all that we have, all that we are, all that we will be, and use it to bring yourself glory. May we be a light that shines out in your name, Jesus. Amen. Not sure you can go ahead. Uh, while the plates are being passed, uh, let me just remind you, uh, you do have the option to give to our ministry online. Uh, there's a link that you can find on our Facebook page and the live feed. Uh, there's a link you can find also on our, our church web page, um, anchorpeople.org. Uh, and that's, it's just real easy to set up. It's safe uh, and effective. It, it really simplifies things for you. So uh, don't be afraid to check that out. Uh, I want to remind you about Ladies Crafting Day. Uh, ladies, Saturday morning, August 7th. That'll be here before you know it. Uh, 10 o'clock downstairs, 10 to 11.30. Uh, I think Stephanie has the details on that, along with branches. <laughs> I'm just glad that wasn't somebody's side mirror there. It's just a branch. Um, VBS at the end of August. Uh, that'll also be here very quickly. And I know Stephanie's uh, got some things planned to start advertising that. Uh, of course, the best way to advertise is just word of mouth, right? Let people uh, that you know with kids know that we're doing a, a VBS here uh, for three days at the end of August. And let's help Stephanie. Let's pitch in and do this together as a church. Uh, softball, we've got a game Tuesday night at 9 o'clock, 9.15 actually. So uh, if you like being out late, come out to Sweeney Park at 9.15. Uh, it should be a little cooler by then as well. That's Tuesday night. Sunday school uh, each Sunday uh, with Rick Bailey at 9 and Scott Harris at 8.30. Bible study on Zoom online each Thursday at 7. And hey, here's, here's some good news. I want to just say another congratulations to everyone that was baptized last Sunday. If you were, if you were baptized, will you stand up real quick for us? We just want to celebrate you again. Uh, Heather, Sandra, Hillary, Tanya, God bless you. God bless you. Um, and Kareen, too, if you're watching there online. So uh, that's such a blessing. Um, okay, so I promised we'd wrap up pretty quick here. Um, look over these sermon sequel questions. I know it's, it's so easy, right? Once you leave here, once you get in the car and drive away, to let life flood in again, to let life become busy and, and, and take over again. But I want you to take your notes home. I, I want you to take these questions home. I maybe take somebody out to lunch and talk about these questions with them. You know, What are the steps I can take to start living this out today? How can things start to be different today? Because here's the truth. If, if, they, if they don't start today, you're probably not going to start, right? You probably say, ah, I'll, I'll, I'll get some of that vision stuff going tomorrow. 
And then Monday will be busy, right? And then Tuesday, something will go wrong, and life will be haywire. And by Wednesday, you've forgotten all about it. Do something today. Answer some of these questions today. And ask God to plant that vision in your heart today. All right, music team, why don't you come on back up? We'll sing a couple songs together. Uh, the songs are here on the back of your sheet. Um, let's stand up, man, and let's get ready to sing some praise to God.
I search the world, but I couldn't find me. Man's empty place, treasures the pain, never enough. And you came around, put me back together. My blue design is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing that's better than you. There's nothing that's better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. The failures of Christ let you sit in the lost till you call me a friend. Is the God of the mountain, the God of the valley. Your mercy and grace when I need again. There was nothing that's better than you. There was nothing that's better than you. There was nothing. Nothing is better than you. Turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. To shake me to glory, you're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens, you turn bones into diamonds, you turn seas into highways, you're the only one who can. You're the There's nothing It's better than you There's nothing It's better than you There's nothing Nothing is better than you There's There's nothing It's better than you There's nothing It's better than you There's Nothing is better than you. You turn graves to gardens. You turn graves into gardens. You turn birds into lovers. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the team. It's so good to be together as the church, to sing God's praises together. I pray that you will pursue the vision he has for your life. Look to him. Look to him.